that love is maybe even the more important reason that Jesus was on that cross as well, certainly to forgive my sins, but ultimately because of his love for me, that he shows me my dignity, he shows me my worth by choosing to die on that cross. Welcome to This Whole Life, a podcast for all of us seeking sanity and sanctity, and a place to find joy and meaning through the integration of faith and mental health. I'm Kenna Malay, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm with my husband, Pat Malay, a Catholic speaker, musician, and leader. We invite you to our kitchen table. Okay, not literally, but but you're definitely invited into the conversations that we seem to keep having once the kids have scattered off to play and we're left doing the dishes. We're excited to share this podcast for educational purposes. It is not intended as therapy or as a substitute for mental health care. So let's get talking about this whole life. I'm not gonna say- Happy resurrection from this whole life. Christ Woo-hoo! is risen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, my friends. Happy Easter, Kenna Ray. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It's good to be um, in this Easter octave with you, my love, and with our people. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we're we're looking forward to living this up. Um, you've always told me from day one that if I am going to take us all to the depths of Lent, that you are going to help us soar to the heights of Easter. <laughs> the only reason that I'm willing to wander in the desert is if there's a promised land. So thank you for allowing us to celebrate the resurrection well. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I feel like it's safer now to ask you about your high and hard now that we're here. And the funny part about podcasting, obviously, is that there may be folks listening to this very episode, these exact words right now, in like October of 2024. You know? <laughs> so if that's you, if you're listening to these words and it hasn't been Easter for like three months or more. Hey, this is transcendent. Then, these right. truths are. We are an Easter of, people. Right, right. Every Sunday is a little Easter. Yes. So our children we, remind us that all Lent long when they want to eat sweets and watch TV shows. <laughs> but mommy. Technically, it doesn't count, mom. <laughs> it's not part of the 40 days. Oh, seriously. Yeah. So if, if this is not timely specifically, just remember that we get to be living and and in the life of the resurrection all year long. It is the energy that keeps us going through this earthly pilgrimage. So celebrate with us, even if it's like Amen, hallelujah, baby. the second week of Lent next year, I guess, you know, <laughs> but celebrate in an appropriate way, maybe liturgically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, coming out of the triduum for us now, as we record this in 2023, what are your highs and hards reflections over the, the past, you know, little amount of time here, babe? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So my heart is an anticipatory hard. I am I am notorious for anticipating things. Some might call that anxious or high strung. I call it I anticipate well. And so what I anticipate now having been on God's green earth for a lot of Lent and Easter's is that Lent gives me a lot of structure, which is perhaps why it is my <clears throat> preferred liturgical season of the year. And that's not a popular thing to say, but I'm just going to go out there and say it. And so Coming into Easter, it feels like the wild, wild west. And it feels like the wheels have fallen off and it, like life is rogue. And I I mean, like, yeah, it just kind of freaks me out that there Anything aren't these goes. rules anymore. <laughs> and so I'm anticipating a little turbulence as I figure out what is life like for me in the Easter season and then going back into ordinary time. Um, So, I mean, I I guess we could say if that's the hardest thing I've got going on right now, (laughs) I'm anticipating the lack of structure um, (laughs) that, you know, Lent uh, gave me. And now I have to like elect maybe some of that structure. Like Mm -hmm. I have to choose Mm it, um, which may be hard for you to hear as I will share more with you, Pat, about (laughs) what I'm electing to bring with me into real life out of Lent. Oh, (laughs) boy. But yeah, but that is that is hard for me. Um, I like those guardrails. I need I I learned early, like I think it's because I I am rather childlike. And so having those parameters, having those boundaries are really helpful for me. Um, 
yeah, they give they give some rules to the road uh, for this holy life I'm trying to live. I so, would love uh, if you're listening. I would love to know <laughs> if anyone else out there also if your favorite season of the church year is Lent. I would love to hear from you. Both. <laughs> Both to encourage my bride as one of the only people I am blessed to know who loves Lent more than any other time of year, and also to help me get a more authentic sense of people out there uh, and help me understand that uh, there's really more value to Lent than I can see as a very <laughs> Easter-focused person. So uh, shoot us an email. Go on the website. Let us know if that's you. I'd love to you know, drop us a note yes, on Instagram. please be my friend. I would love be to Be part know. of my yeah. support group <laughs> we'll as like, we move into Easter. We'll start a Lenten Bible study where all you do is read Job and Lamentations. <laughs> no, I need it into Easter. I got Lent covered. It's coming into Easter that I am like, what is happening right now? Um, so that is my hard. Um, my high would be um, we had a really full triduum. I mean, I think with each year that Ooh. passes and as our children, you know, become older and we get to invite them into the traditions that we've been celebrating, you know, for a long time that are like after their bedtime, um, like the vigil and, you know, this year our oldest two were able to watch the beginning of the Passion of the Christ movie with us. Um, and just even having, you know, neighbors and friends over um, for, you know, participating in different parts of, of the Triduum and mm -hmm. now of Easter mm -hmm. and our kids sitting in and listening to the conversation we're having and listening to people reflect on how their Lenten journey was and, and what brings them joy about being in relationship with the Lord. Like, it's just, it's such a high, like, this is what my vocation is about. Like, this is catechesis, right? Echoing the faith and passing it on. And these are the things that drew me to motherhood, mm -hmm. um, was mm -hmm. this idea of evangelizing through the domestic church. Right. Um, so just that high of getting to, to live this out and to see, like, it is even more beautiful than I had envisioned. And I had high hopes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So that's my high. Um, what about you, Mr. Easter? Um, <laughs> highs and hearts. I'm like, you're like a confetti egg about to explode on me or something. I'm like, can I handle the joy that's about to be unleashed? No, it's fine. I'm gonna, so my, my obvious high is just the joy of Easter and all this buildup that culminates in the beautiful Easter vigil and the party immediately afterward and all the feasting. In, in family and food and drink that we all get to partake in because Christ is risen and we get to celebrate. We ought to celebrate. We have to celebrate. Um, so that's obvious. I'm going to put that out there, but I'm not going to belabor it because it would take over the entire episode, which is not what this is about. Um, so I'm going to come back to my my other kind of like lesser high, but it's still substantial enough for me right now. Uh, my hard was um, during the Good Friday service this year. Uh, we went in the afternoon and we brought all of our children and we knew going in, this one is going to be a, a tricky one. <laughs> Just buckle up because it's it's an hour and a half bare minimum and we've got veneration of the cross. We've got communion later on. Uh, there's the passion reading from John's gospel, which is unspeakably beautiful and just real long. So <laughs> uh, we knew going in, it was going to be dicey and it certainly was. And, and it's like the hardest time of day for yes, our children at three right. to five o'clock hour. Yeah, yeah. Late afternoon. Yeah. It was, it was really tricky. So there was a moment where I had a bit of a disciplinary situation with one of our children, one of our toddlers in the back of church. And uh, there was a good amount of it that was like good, appropriate discipline for a child to learn how to control their behavior and their their voice in church right just training and reverence and respect for others respect for god of course you know and then there was some small percentage of it that was just me being angry that they weren't letting me pray the way oh, I wanted to. Yeah. So, and of course that happened immediately before veneration of the cross, right? Mm. So I'm like going up to venerate the cross of Christ. And my prayer is like, Lord, please help me for all the ways that I am appropriately disciplining and training our children in a good sense of how to pray. And would you please have mercy on the parts of me that just lashed out five minutes ago <laughs> mm -hmm. in the back of church? Oh, oh Lord, I gosh. need you. Yes. <laughs> like right now. So in that this was moment. tangible, but hard and yeah. difficult and a good reminder of why we need that cross in the first place. So 
That was good. Um, my high, aside from the glory of the resurrection, which is timeless and constant, uh, is that I always feel I let me know if this gets over overwhelming listener because sometimes i feel like my highs and hearts are just like the bi-weekly minnesota weather report for you you know uh, and again if you're listening to this in like new mexico in october you don't care about what's happening in minnesota in april but literally on good friday it was like 40 degrees right it the high of 40 it was windy gross. there oh was still gosh. like a foot of snow all over the ground it yeah. was it was appropriate actually it was fitting for good friday it was great and fine it was wretched and yes. then Holy Saturday, it all started to shift, right? It was like the glimmer of hope on the horizon. And Easter Sunday was this like glorious 75 degree sunny. It was the, the first warm day of the year. Snow is melting. Like the white witch has been banished from Narnia, right? Like it was just the most perfect metaphor for the resurrection, like new life happening right before my very eyes. And in my world, what that means is I get to break out my. 90s and 2000s country music playlist, which <laughs> only happens. It's a very time specific playlist in my life. I only listen to country during the spring and summer, early fall. Uh, and when it gets cold, I put it away because I can't handle singing about sunshine and country roads when it's like negative 20, you know, bare feet and blue jeans. And... Correct. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I'd have blue feet if I had bare feet <laughs> because I, they'd be frostbitten. Um, so just like the, the symbolism of pulling that out on Easter Sunday, Easter octave week is so beautiful. And so, uh, such a great consolation after a long and hard Lent and winter. And, um, uh, yeah, if you are interested in country music and if you, like us, enjoy country music uh, up until about the year 2010 or so, maybe, you know, lots of Keith Urban, Sugarland, Tim McGraw, Zach Brown Band. If that's your like vibe, uh, look us up on Spotify. I'll share the playlist in the show notes and you can listen in. You can like it on on Spotify and you can listen in wherever it's you a, want. It's a goodie, guys. It's I a spent goodie. a lot of time curating this playlist. <laughs> Over the course of years, it's I think it's up to like almost 10 hours of song oh play. If you listen straight through, yes. it's the best, um, which leads me to a brief transition into what we're going to talk about with Easter and the resurrection, just how it connects to what this whole life is all about. Um, we also you and I kind of work together over the past few years to put together a, sh a much shorter, but <laughs> more than meaningful, maybe Easter playlist we've titled He is Risen, appropriately enough, definitely caps lock. And we're going to share that in the show notes as well. Just a great way for you to to listen along with us, to pray along with us during the joy of the resurrection. Um, I would say like anyone who appreciates good music, it's heavy on the Matt Maher, but there's also plenty of other good Christian entries of resurrection type music. There's also some more kind of secular music that just gives us the resurrection vibe. So um, again, we'll share that. We'll put it on Instagram and you can join in with us and listen to that uh, as you go too. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Hey, very much my pleasure. <laughs> I don't do much well, but I make playlists you stop like it. nobody's business. <laughs> you you hold on to that mix CD title, Mr. Right. Mr. Mix CD. Correct. Of yes. 2000. Oh, cool. I used cool, to cool. love the mix CD. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember very specific mix CDs that I made for other people and that other people made for me yes. because they were so good. Your your buds, your one friend, still makes you mixed CDs. He does, so, yeah. As because if, we still drive a van that that plays mixed CDs that accepts CDs. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's the its only preferred vehicle. form of musical currency. <laughs> oh man! Well, um, it's really exciting just to to reflect a little bit on the Triduum and on Easter in in the ways that it connects to what this whole life is all about about seeking sanity and sanctity. And as we've talked about on this podcast before, and in some of the other ways that we've kind of, you know, put content out there, the idea that good sanctity, true holiness is always connected to reality about being connected to reality, to what's real, to what's present, and that God's presence is most tangible in the present moment, right? Not stuck in the past, not dreaming about the future. Um, there's certainly a time and a place to reflect on the past and to plan for the future, but that God's grace is available now in the present. And it's only in the present that I can even reflect on the past or plan for the future. Um, Thank you, Peter Kreif. Exactly. Yes. Right. So all kinds of ways that um, 
the Triduum and Easter really remind us of that reality, that that we are called to be grounded in reality, to seek mental and spiritual health in lots of different ways. Um, and the one that I was telling you about, Kenna, that was most tangible to me, this, this Triduum, was during that Good Friday service when I was um, in one of the rare moments where I could pray and reflect really well, uh, was um, thinking through kind of the meaning of the cross in a few different ways, but especially the ways that it relates to our human experience. Um, I think there are lots of ways that that you and I have had conversations from a mental health, more kind of clinical therapy side of things where um, there, there can be these two extremes in someone's sense of themselves, their own, their own sense of self, where on one extreme, you've got someone who maybe leans in the direction of, you know, narcissism would be kind of the clinical term for it, but, uh, even lesser than that, just a, a sense that they themselves are above the rules so, somehow or above the law that, that they're not responsible or accountable to their actions and that the the traditional rules that apply to everyone else don't necessarily apply to them because of XYZ exception or whatever, you know, um, letting, letting myself off the hook from responsibility, accountability, things like that. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the other opposite, but equally dangerous extreme of someone who uh, doesn't recognize or see their own inherent goodness and dignity that maybe they do dwell too much on their their sins their wrongdoing or the things that have been harmful to them that are certainly not their fault but they feel the weight of that suffering trauma heartbreak whatever you know that so on one hand you've got someone who isn't aware enough of their own weakness their own sins their own failures their own need for god and for others and on the other hand, you've got someone who isn't aware enough of their own goodness, of their own dignity, their own value and and um, worth. And I was thinking through that on Good Friday, coming up to veneration of the cross, this beautiful tradition that happens once a year and is such a, a kind of linchpin of the Triduum services. You know, we've got kind of the, the the feast and the celebration of Holy Thursday with the Eucharist and the priesthood and service and the washing of the feet. We've got the Easter vigil and the catechumens and the, the return of the Gloria and the Alleluia on Saturday night. And right in the middle, we've got this chance to honor the cross, right? Not to worship it because it's not God, but to venerate it like we venerate saints and holy statues and things like that, to, to honor them because of what they remind us of in the truth. And approaching the cross, um, I was feeling really aware of the ways that our faith helps us to avoid those two dangerous extremes, that in the middle is reality, is is God's grace present in this moment that says, um, on one hand, I am a sinner and I have done wrong and I need to be responsible and accountable for the things that I have done to hurt others. and It is in part because of my sins, specifically because of my sins, that Jesus was on that cross in the first place, that that my sins put him on that cross. And that doesn't mean that I am worthless, quite the contrary, which I'll get to in a moment, but it does mean that I need to approach that cross out of absolute spiritual poverty, that, that I am in need of his grace and his presence and his forgiveness at all times in all situations, you know. But at the same time, in the exact same moment, this beautiful both and, that even in spite of my sins and weaknesses and failures, in spite of the times that I've chosen separation from God, that I am loved perfectly and eternally and irrevocably by God. And that love is maybe even the more important reason that Jesus was on that cross as well, certainly to forgive my sins. But ultimately, because of his love for me, that he shows me my dignity, he shows me my worth by choosing to die on that cross. Um, And I I just love the image of the cross of Good Friday and, of course, the empty tomb on Saturday and Sunday, um, the ways that they remind us of the reality of ourselves, that we are we are made good, but we're fallen. We are beautiful, but we're broken and holding those two things in tension 
really, I think, leads us into Easter really well of knowing ourselves truly and authentically and obviously lead us, leads us into our whole life really well, into our relationships and our work and our prayer, just giving us a really clear sense of, of ourselves in reality. Yeah. I mean, and as I, I listen to you, it really, yeah, it connects to something that I have been praying with all throughout Lent and and that was certainly underscored during the Triduum liturgies. And that is, I mean, just simply like how much we are loved and wanted and pursued and desired. And, you know, being at the Good Friday service, watching the Passion of the Christ movie with our children. And and I don't know, it really struck me anew um, this Lent maybe it's maybe it's the grief you know of these past years like mm. just how much the lord like is with me in the pain and he wants to offer me something even even greater even yeah even more beautiful more um enveloping of my heart than the pain i've suffered the pain i have inflicted on others through my sin mm -hmm. the pain i inflict on myself through my sin you know just his love for me just really did come shining through. And I mean, hmm. yeah, I, I, I let myself, you know, feel the intensity and the reality of his passion and his death, you know, as best I could through the liturgy, through, you know, the movie, through our conversations mm -hmm. and our prayer and things like mm -hmm. that. But I just, yeah, this, this Lent, I really was carried by um, my belovedness. Um, a lot of the, the, um, great you know saints and spiritual writers will talk about like our our son like claiming our sonship claiming our daughtership and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i i do think for me that that unique and um sincere love of the father um was was apparent and felt i don't know i don't know how to explain it just um yeah was deep for me and i think um I think there's something about being another year into motherhood as well um, that allows me to to be able to reflect on that as my children increasingly express their free will and um, and I I know how I feel toward them um, even in their moments where they display their brokenness and mm -hmm. their sinfulness and and my heart aches for love of that sure there's the anger and there's the frustration and there's the irritation but like it aches because I'm like oh don't you know that you are made for more than that decision or for more than that word choice or you know what have you mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I, I think God is giving me a taste of his ache for us and his, he thirsts, right? Like he thirsts and he doesn't just thirst on Good Friday, but every moment of every day of my life. And yeah, I just, I'm I'm coming into Easter with so much gratitude and so much joy. I, I found that like during the liturgies, um, there was a lot of pain for me. I, I think um, my my father died in um, on uh, Easter Wednesday, and so mm -hmm. um, this season will always have deep significance for me. And it was the last, you know, significant time I was with my sister before she was killed. So it's just, it, yeah, it has a lot of meaning for me. And and so there is that sadness, and I also found myself like smiling through the tears of like just still. I don't know. I, I could taste the promise, and mm. and I know that there is so much good to come, um, this life and beyond. Um, so yeah, I, I I love what you're inviting us into, Pat, of like really seeing the the beauty and the all the dimensions of the cross um, in a way that we can not just leave it in Good Friday, mm -hmm. um, because there's so much good news in that cross. Um, there's a reason we have crucifixes, you know, everywhere we, right. um, in our homes, in our offices and things like that, um, because it, it speaks to that love, that deep desire he thirsts for us. Yeah. And the triumph of love too, you know, like the, the uh, good Friday always strikes me as, as the, the depth of love, I guess, like the lengths to which love will go, um, to offer hope and healing to people who are in need, you know, like Jesus went to death and even to hell itself on Holy Saturday out of love, you know, like there's no, there's no length that divine love will not go in order to bring us back to him. 
Um, but Easter Sunday kind of reveals the power of love, which makes me want to put a Huey Lewis and the News song in the show notes as well. Uh, <laughs> and you're welcome for that in advance. Um, but like the 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 love of Christ is also triumphant and it's victorious. You know, it doesn't just end with the beautiful depth of love on Good Friday. It ends with the triumphant, overpowering love on Easter Sunday that that death itself is destroyed by God's love and that the tomb is empty because of God's love, that that Jesus's wounds are not magically taken away, but they're redeemed and they too are resurrected. And he keeps his wounds, the wounds of his crucifixion as a reminder of the the love that he went through on Good Friday. But that love was transformed. His wounds, I should say, were transformed by love on Easter Sunday. And there's no corner of our lives that that doesn't affect then, you know, like uh, you going through continuing stages of grief for your family members who have died. There's, there's hope in their peace and joy that only happens in the resurrection, you know, that uh, there, there is a kind of hope and, um, abiding peace that we can have in this life for those who have died that without the resurrection we would be totally separate from we would have no hope you know and even in less i would say um eternal ways than that there are all kinds of ways that day to day in our lives that all of us are in are in dark places little tombs of our lives you know and we feel trapped in this area of of finances or a difficult marriage or tough family relationships or a bad work situation or an addiction or whatever it is, just like trapped in this little tomb. And, um, you know, the love of Christ doesn't mean that all we have to do is pray in our father and all of our problems go away, right? It's Christ the king, not Christ the magician, you know. Um, but it does mean that God's love is powerful and it's more powerful than anything in this life. So if we submit our entire self to him, then we can have access to the healing that his love provides in our lives. Again, not not to fix our problems and not to go to God merely to fix our problems, but to go to God for his sake and to watch the ways that love offers triumphant healing and victory in our lives, even in the day to day. Well, and I I love that you're using that word power. Um, That was definitely something I was meditating with that word. And as I was reading the scriptures throughout the Triduum, like just so in awe of the way that the Lord used his power. And for, for, you know, maybe someone without faith, they would say he he certainly did not use his power. He was, you know, impotent, like, you know, suffering and, and being silent before the questioning and, you know, all these things. And well, all the people who told him, if you're the Christ come down off that cross, right? right? Like they're thinking of power in only that way, that limited way. Show me your, your magical wizardly power by magically coming down off that cross yeah. and and then I'll know your power and in his humility he showed us the kind of power that you're talking about so absolutely so you know this worldly sense of power is let me show you that I am bigger than stronger than mightier than um you know have more money than whatever mm-hmm. um and the lord's like actually I'm going to like transform your understanding of what it means to have power mm-hmm. and sometimes it means to refrain from using it um you know, there's there's so many quotes we could name right now about the concept of freedom like right. true freedom and but but really like to then be able to celebrate on Easter the manifestation of that power and to like, oh, this, this is what he was waiting for. And so like you said, Pat, when we have these moments of tomb, you know, being entombed in our own lives, this suffering and this darkness and this not knowing and this lack of clarity and pain and brokenness and maybe isolation and and cut off and estrangement, like all the things that feel like those tombs. Um, as people of faith, we get we get to live in this trust and this confidence that like there is there is an Easter Sunday to 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 match to follow up. Maybe not in this life, to be honest, I, I cannot guarantee that. Right. Um, but like letting God manifest His power, you know, in our lives, and um, yeah, it just that was something that that was a recurring theme in my prayer. I think you and I have been talking lately about how power feels so important to me. And it's something that I (laughs) really have to like keep 
tabs on um, and make sure that I'm, you know, continuing to use it in a way that is virtuous. And so I think that strikes me, like to have the Lord as my model of like, what is true power? Like what is power that brings good and brings truth and brings beauty into this world? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he is our, he is our example. Yeah. Right. I think of there's, um, uh, that acceptance speech that Chris Pratt gave at like the MTV video awards or whatever that thing was a few years ago that again, I'll put this video in the show notes because it's just amazing what he did in this funny four minute acceptance speech. He went through his like 10 oh, rules brilliant. of life, you know, it was brilliant. And it's Chris Pratt. So four of them are totally absurd and ridiculous and hilarious. And the other six were like the most beautiful summary of I would even say scriptural truth that I've ever heard a celebrity give to the most secular audience possible, right? Of like MTV fans in live person at this acceptance speech and people all over the world on YouTube and things like that. But one of the things that he talked about was um, using your power for good, right? Like if, if you're smart, if you're funny, if you're powerful, uh, those things can be used as weapons against the weak, and that makes you a bully. Um, so you have to use your intelligence, your power, your influence for good and to serve those who are most vulnerable, right? Like that that sense of power is totally antithetical to everything the world says about power. You know, if you think of uh, Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness, which we talk about in Lent every single year. And one of the things that he offers him is power, right? Like, Every one of these kingdoms can be yours and everyone will will um, be under your beck and call. And all you have to do is this tiny little thing. All you have to do is worship me, right? So he says that to Jesus. He offers him this like, it's, which is really funny. He's offering the God of the universe earthly power, right? Like, I don't really know who, th- who the devil thinks he's fooling, but uh, he offers that him that power because it is tempting for all of us. Christ, thank goodness, can overcome all temptation and he did overcome every temptation, Um, But for the rest of us, it's a learning process to learn how to use the power that Jesus offers us, which is power expressed in humility, in the midst of pain and suffering, that we don't inflict our will on others. Uh, Go back a couple episodes to the free will and other episodes that we did, Um, but we use the power of Christ to offer ourselves as servants, to, to live out that Holy Thursday example and to wash feet even of those who we don't like and of those who hurt us like Judas hurt Jesus, you know, um, that's the kind of power that I think the whole Triduum and Easter shows us, but that's the exact same power that rises on Sunday too. So it's not power in a way that always remains humble and weak and, um, flying under the radar of the world. It's the kind of power that does triumph over everything, just not in ways that this world can appreciate or even identify usually. Yeah. I mean, the Lord knows what he's doing, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that's that's maybe the um, oversimplification of, <laughs> of the takeaway of that. Like, oh, God, you knew what you were up to. Like you had a plan. I didn't see it. I couldn't understand it. <laughs> So whenever you're listening to this episode, whether it's, you know, right now, April 2023, or if it's, you know, October, December, February 2026, whatever, whenever you're listening to this, um, I wonder if a decent challenge by choice for all of us might be um, doing a little bit of prayer and reflection over um, one or more tombs that might be present in your life right now one or more places where there seems to be um, uh, the presence of darkness or feeling trapped or confused or afraid, Um, a relationship that's really difficult and there doesn't seem to be an obvious way of healing for that relationship, Um, a part of your own personality or character or behavior that feels at odds with what you desire to be at odds with your values. And you're not really sure how to bring that behavior, that action, that habit into right order with your values and your beliefs, what you desire to be about, um, a certain addiction, a certain practice, a certain, um, habit that, that leaves you feeling maybe constrained or feeling trapped, you know, um, just that, that image of Christ in the tomb is such a stark visceral image to me, at least it's a place of, of death and stench and, 
um, a lack of freedom, you know, and in prayer and reflection, inviting the Lord into that place to let his power be known in the ways that he desires and asking for the grace to be open to what God desires to do with that tomb in your life to, to let the light in as the, the, to, the stone is rolled away like Easter Sunday, um, to, to let the fresh air in to kind of invite that, that darkness to just dissipate and disappear, um, to invite Christ to offer healing and power in the ways that he desires into the dark spaces in your life, you know? Oh, I love that. I love that. My Lenten heart is singing right now, Pat. Like <laughs> you claim to be all this Easter stuff. That was an Easter just... challenge by choice. What do yeah. you mean? <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, even I have to acknowledge that Lent is necessary and good and that there can be no Easter Sunday without Good Friday and all of the 40 days that prepares <laughs> our hearts for Easter Sunday. And with, even I can if understand. If you could say that with a little less eye roll, we would all be convinced right now. <laughs> the people cannot see my eye rolls. They don't know that. You didn't have to tell them. <laughs> they, can, they can hear it in your tone, my darling. Uh, yeah. Well, should we bring this plane in for a landing? Absolutely. Do you mind wrapping us up in prayer? Yeah, I would love to do that. Great. I'd love to do that. <sighs> Lord Jesus, come. Come more fully and completely and triumphantly into our lives, into our hearts, into our souls, Lord. Give us the grace this Easter season to desire you above all things, to want communion with you, to want perfect relationship with you for all of eternity, that that could motivate us in our vocations in our places of work, in our communities, in our parishes, that our hearts would be on fire with love for you, that we would be inspired by what you have done on the cross for us. We pray for those who are listening now, Lord, who do question your love for them who perhaps have felt like they are in the tomb for a long time. We ask you to meet them there and that we could in some way, if it is your will, bring, bring you, Lord Jesus, to them. All this we ask in your holy and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, love. Absolutely. Thanks for reminding me that it's good to do these mini episodes and just get to share and grow this community. Um, so thank you for being a part of our community listeners. And we ask that you continue to um, journey with us. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Um, rate it, review this podcast, tell us what you're thinking through um, the website, um, thiswholelifepodcast.com. You can find us on Instagram at This Whole Life Podcast on Facebook as well under that same name. Um, yeah, let us know what you want to hear and let us know how you're celebrating and living out these 50 Easter days. Um, so God bless you all. And we look forward to being with you next time on This Whole Life Podcast. Happy Resurrection. You're not alone. You're not alone. This Whole Life is a production of the Martin Center for Integration. Visit us online at thiswholelifepodcast.com. This, I mean, remember in the beginning when I used to make us re-record everything? I do. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't very, that. Very it well. wasn't that long ago. <laughs>